All honor, praise, and glory go to you. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. If you can give the Lord a great praise if you're able. You may be seated. Bible says to bind the word as frontlets between thine eyes. Put them on the doorposts. Teach them to your children. Talk about it when you walk amongst the way. In theory, I want you to know why your daddy's crying today. I want to teach you something about the God that you'll serve for the rest of your life. Your daddy was in terrible trouble. Your daddy was in terrible trouble. And there were devils and people who wanted to bury me. They didn't want your daddy to live. They didn't want the ministry to live. And it looked like they were winning. Abounding in love. He rescued your daddy. 
And when I look back over my life, he's always rescued me. I've never not been rescued. This is why we serve Jesus, because he loved us first. You'll serve him all the days of your life. I can't wait for you to grow up so I can tell you more. But just know that these are what daddy calls happy tears. Because God's been good to me. Hallelujah. And he's been good to your mama. Hallelujah. And he's been good to you, sweet girl. Hallelujah. And it's been good to this church. Hallelujah. And he's sending reinforcements. And he's sending the right people. And he's running swiftly with healing in his wings. And I just need a couple of people to worship God right now. Because I don't have any more words. I just need somebody to... You have... You have... on her spirit. Y'all go ahead and be seated. Even while you're sitting, just give the Lord a, just an applause, just an applause. Feel the Holy Ghost. And I'm never going. Does anybody else feel the Holy Spirit here today? What's the new baby's name? What's the new baby's name? Caleb. Caden. Caden, well, Father, I thank you for your presence here, and I pray from the youngest baby, Caden, to our most seasoned saint, that you would do a right now miracle in each of our lives that marks this as a Sunday, the Lord's Day, unlike any Sabbath uh, that we've had. We know that the Sabbath is the last day of the week, which would be sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. But I'm declaring that this is the Lord's day, the day that Jesus rose up. We count it as a Sabbath. And so uh, according to Galatians, we don't even celebrate feasts and new moons and those things anymore. We are grafted in. And so it's not when we worship, it's that we worship. And so we worship you this afternoon. Your presence is here. Speak through your word, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I would say to forgive me of my emotion, but I don't seek forgiveness because I don't need forgiveness. God has been good to me. I said God has been good to me. And we have stepped into three days of miracles. 31 minutes ago, I'm prophesying. Elder Burnside, I, I prophesy that the next 72 hours are going to be so significant that we won't be able to catch our breath with how fast God 
establishes that we are exactly where we're supposed to be. Because some of us, some of you are like me, you came here on faith. And I need to, I need to faith, where are my faith walkers? You are a faith walker. I need you to know that as you were walking, God was releasing. I'm going to say it again. As you were walking, God was releasing. So every step you took, he threw something else in front of you that you don't see yet. But he wasn't throwing it until you moved because he needed you to move first before he started distributing certain things. But God is about to allow you to see what he put in the path as you said yes to God. And you didn't say yes out of your flesh. You said yes out of your spirit. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, starting at the 11th verse. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. I don't want happiness, I want joy. Amanda, happy and sad are on both opposite ends of a spectrum, but joy is a fruit of the spirit that says, I am not moved by what anyone says. I am not moved by what I see. I am moved by the word of God, and he has already spoken over me. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at somebody, tell them, I love you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all the things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Let's go back to the 12th verse. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's number one. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Number two, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. There it is again. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. I chose you. There are people that don't like you uh, because they think you have too much. You always seem to win. You don't look like you go, any, go through anything. They don't know what you go through because you don't look like what you've been through. <sighs> I didn't choose you. You did not choose me, I chose you. Very important for the, for the people who want to move you out of a preset position of authority that they didn't choose you, God chose you. You didn't choose it, God chose you for it. I'll speak over here. That job, you didn't apply, God wanted you to apply, he had the job for you. That position, that was yours before you got there. Somebody else might have been in it, but it was yours the entire time. <sighs> Help me to preach it like I'm supposed to, Jesus. See, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. God is looking for people that will produce fruit and long-term fruit, not temporary fruit, not wishy-washy saints that are hot one day and cold the next but somebody that has enough substance and long-term history with God that you are not moved by anything because you've been walking with him too long. So when the wind comes and the rain comes, even if the leaves fly off, the rooting is still strong and the trunk is not moved, no matter what happens. Isn't it strange that a car could hit a tree and somebody in the car doesn't live, but the tree keeps moving, keeps living? All it has is a dent. Isn't it strange that something that's thousands of pounds moving so fast can be stopped by a tree? Well, is it the wood? No, it's not the wood, it's the roots. 
and the enemy keeps messing with you, and the reason why is because he's hoping that you're shallow. And every time he hits you, you... Am I talking to anybody that's been hit? But you don't go down. I'm looking for some people that have been hit. But you don't break. You might bend. But you don't break. And you still produce fruit. You still worship God. You still love his word. You still serve the kingdom. You still walk in the local church. Am I talking to anybody? I want you to have fruit that remain. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, whatever you ask the Father, your prayer request, if it lines up with my word and my will, I'm doing it. But if it doesn't line up with my word and my will, I'm not obligated to answer it. I'm not answering selfish prayers. I'm not answering carnal prayers. I'm not answering immature prayers. I'm not answering prayers to kill people. Kill them, Lord. They hurt my feelings. I bind that devil. I don't, don't pray that kind of stuff. That's not God's will. That's not the character of Jesus. That's witchcraft. You can't pray outside of his will and expect him to bless it. Lord, bless me. That's my husband. Not, he's not your husband if he's somebody else's husband. You don't pray prayers outside of his will and expect God to answer. These things, that, these things I command you that you love one Another, look at somebody else, tell them, say, listen, I mean this, I love you. I want the best for you. Tell them, I say, I want the best for you. Multiple times in this scripture, Jesus refers to friends. He said, if you're my friend, you'll do what I command. My friends, no longer are you a servant, you're my friend. And I want to teach for a few minutes from the subject heading friend requests friend request you can be seated proverbs 18 and 24 says a man who has friends must first show himself friendly but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother how many people in here have friends how many of us have them friends ones you can depend on Friends, before we go any further, let's be. How many people have friends? How many people have best friends? How many people have hitters? How many people have saved friends? Sometimes you'll say, friends, get on your nerves because they give you scripture when you don't want it. How many of us have street friends? Tell the truth. You, you, don't, want, you don't really want to tell the truth in here, but you actually like that you have street friends because if it goes down, they, what? They said what? Listen, let me tell you what blesses me. I'm... <laughs> I'm being Petty LaBelle right now, but, you know, people say a lot of different things, and every now and then my wife will tell me, like, somebody put something under the, you know, a post, and then somebody who loves us, like, say one more thing about my pastor. <laughs> that thing just blesses me, because I'm like, no, we got to stay saved. And I am saved, but I ain't been saved that long. I want to talk about this idea of friends because everybody is not your friend. I learned that the hard way. 2019, according to the Hebrew, uh, was the year of sight. It, God wanted to show you some things. And what I learned in 2019 is that everybody who's smiling is not my friend. Everybody who's in my proximity is not for me. That I actually have people who, who are able to talk to me, but genuinely don't like me. And that's strange, because I can't do that. 
I wear my heart on my sleeve. Uh, and God had to show me that you have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. I'm going somewhere. Jesus did not take friendship lightly. I don't take friendship lightly. The first day of my ninth grade year going to Withrow High School, I had to catch the 51 bus on the corner of Dana Avenue and Vic Victory Parkway. Uh, and then I caught the 11 bus and it would take me <clears throat> to school. And on the first day of school, there was a guy on the bus with me, and he had a briefcase and glasses and a suit. And he looked like a grown man, but he was only 15, like me. And we ended up introducing ourselves on our way to school, walking up Madison Road in Cincinnati towards our new high school. His name was Justin Taylor. Justin ended up becoming my best friend. He wasn't just my buddy, he was my friend. We went on double dates together. We were, we'd be in the park with the, with the radio blasting, slow jamming. This is before you, boo. This is, I, was, I, was on, I was a teenager. Don't even worry about it. We, let's chill. Hey, let's settle down. Settle down. I, I'm still getting an allowance. Talking about let's settle down. <laughs> From the first time. You, don't act like you that saved. You know the song. She was like, you have rescued my life from the first time. <laughs> he was my friend. We did life together. We celebrated critical moments together. He called my mama, mom. I called his mom, mom. We would spend the night over each other's houses. We did everything together. We'd go to the mall together. We'd get blue jean shirts, the white jeans. We'd get some K-Swiss. We'd even have a tie. We would rock them joints to the, to, the, to the Friday night dance after the football game, and we would practice our dance at the house before we got to the dance. Anybody practice your dance? I know you're saved now, but when you were growing up, it's nine of y'all. See, y'all missed it. Larry, too. Larry McGugan. This is also one of my best friends. Known him since ninth grade. When I would go to his house, he lived in the suburbs. To me, I thought he was rich because, you know, he had a fresh pair of Air Jordans. I didn't know any different, but we, we grew up together. We, we watched, you know, Yo! MTV raps. We would watch, you know, yeah, because they had cable. Mama didn't have cable. Still don't got cable. That's why when I go to the house, I stay at a hotel. I need ESPN. She watching Snow White and Pocahontas on VHS. Am I lying? <laughs> You really got to watch Pocahontas. It is amazing. I'm like, Mama, you are 77 years old. You don't have nothing else to watch. <laughs> but when you build friendship as a teenager and you build friendship that lasts and spans over years, you got some credit with me. Anybody got friends that have credit, even if you don't talk to them every day? Sometimes you don't talk to them for months, but they are your friends. My other homeboy, Jerry Hunter, I've known him since probably I was eight, nine years old. And his dad would come pick us up in his, was it a Trans Am? It was a Trans Am. And I would sit in the back. This is when I was much smaller. I would sit in the back of a two-seat Trans Am, and his dad would take us to see Empire Strikes Back every Friday. They would drop us off, and we would eat popcorn and watch Star Wars. Now, some of y'all don't watch Star Wars, whatever to y'all. But when we were growing up, Star Wars was the thing. And, and so when I have friends and you are my friend, I roll with you ride or die. It's different now. Allegiance can be purchased. But there's no price on loyalty. What I've learned is that the definition of friendship has changed over the years. Because the cats that were friends with me before I became all this are the ones I trust the most. Because they loved me when I had nothing to offer but my comedy, but my skills, and my mama's chicken. And, and those are the people that, that I want to bless in this season. Whether it's Larry McGugan or Jerry Hunter or, or Justin Taylor. Justin was my main man. Hunter Grand, 24 years old. Cancer took him. The reason why I bring that up is not to sober the mood but it is to help you and I to understand that when you have real friends, cherish them. 
And in this scripture, we find Jesus having a very vulnerable moment. And he says to the men that he's been walking with for three years, you are no longer my servants. I'm not talking to you as a disciple. I'm talking to you as my friend. Because a friend doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've told you everything that God has told me. That brings us into another level of relationship. I say this because in 2020, what the Lord has impressed upon me this morning is that many of the things that are attached to your life are going to be connected to who you're walking with in your life, which means you need to take a very real assessment of every relationship. There can be no undefined relationships in your life in 2020. Nobody shouts. They, they, um, sometimes we want things more than we want the discipline to embrace it when it comes. Some of the things that God wants to give you, he's not giving you because there are people in your life that would mess it up if it showed up. I'm talking right. 2020, God told me, he said, tell Relentless Church that it's about management and proper placement of people, and it will be invaluable in this season of your life. Everybody needs to have a place. Let me say this again. You can't have accidental relationships. Everyone needs to have a purpose. You need to be careful of who has your ear, who has your heart, and who has your time. Because... I heard Bishop Jay say this, and it really blew me away. He said, I'd rather you waste my money than my time. Because I can go get more money, but I can't get more time. If you're not invested in me, get away from me. If you don't really mean me any good, get away. And if you won't get away, I'm going to make you go away. Because I'm taking responsibility for the people in my life, the relationships in my life. And at this stage of my life as a pastor, I need to cultivate relationships that are pushing me into the fulfillment of my destiny. I'm not the 30-year-old itinerant evangelist. I'm a 46-and-a-half-year-old grown man. I'm the pastor of a church that's expanding around the globe, and I need the right people who understand who I am, value my anointing, value my leadership, and will help me to build what God wants me to build. And I don't have time for games, and if you don't like me, that's fine. But you will like me from, you will not like me from a distance. You won't be eating my food and not liking me. For some reason, I forgot who I was for a few months because when you're battling and you're in warfare, you think the world is as small as the battle you're in. But the world is bigger than the battle you're in. Your anointing is bigger than the thing you're in. And that's why God sometimes needs to step you out, show you who you are so you can go back into the battle and understand who you are. And in this season, what I realized is I, I need to stop apologizing for the fact that God has anointed me for what it is I'm called to do. Begging people to see me, hoping they like me. I'm not here to be like. I'm here to take over. I'm here to take that spirit that's been in this region and tell it you can't stay here anymore. And I don't need patty cake friends. I need some warriors. I need a couple of loud, rowdy. Even Jesus was strategic in the people that he chose, knowing that they would become friends. He knew Peter was impetuous. He knew Peter would go from great revelation to great lack of faith. He knew that Peter would go from asking him to walk on water to saying, I don't know him. But he invested in him because he understood that you don't throw away people just because they have issues. And here's the thing. My, some of my friends are as imperfect as me, and that's all right. And you will never know it, because I'll never tell you, because they're my friends. And if you got real friends, they're not sitting up whispering about your challenges and your struggles. Your real friends are praying with you, interceding for you, and encouraging you. Are there any real friends in the building? When you're dealing with friendship, you want to 
deal with three areas. If, if you're really my friend, if you're really going to have godly friends in this season, the right people, the right business partners, the right alliances, the right allegiances, then there are three things you need to check. Number one is proximity. Number two is parameters. Number three is purpose. Some of y'all just looking at me, and that's one of the challenges of being a pastor in this season. I don't want to be known as a great orator. I need to go from evangelist to pastor, and pastor says, I want to make sure that you have systems and structure in place so that you can actually be better, not just hear better. The scripture says, don't be fooled. It's not the ones who hear it, it's the ones who do it. Everybody say proximity, parameters, purpose. See, proximity is how close are you and why. Everybody doesn't need to be close in this season. You need to be able to tell the difference between your true friends, an acquaintance, a business relationship, and somebody that's casual that you can speak to and say hi. But in this season, I'm not letting who's casual up close because you don't need to be that close. I need, if you are not in, if you're not serving a purpose, I need to put you at the proper distance from what I carry. Real, real quiet, but I know I'm talking right. Everybody say proximity. Number two is parameters. Parameters are boundaries. What's the boundaries? There are people in your life that don't have boundaries. They think they can come and go as they want. They think they can say what they want. They think they can do what they want. And you need to establish in 2020 that that's, that was 2019. 2020, you don't just call when you want. You don't just expect. You can't borrow money and not pay it back. I'm not lending you anymore. You borrowed $50 last year, and you never brought it up again. And then when I try to bring it up, you get offended like, you don't really need that. It doesn't matter if I need it. It's mine. And you borrowed it. And that's why we don't really need to be close, because you disrespect me. And you take advantage, and then you want to manipulate me based on what you think is our friendship. But if you were really my friend, you would keep your word. It was never about the money. It was about your word. Am I talking to anybody in here? You got to put some boundaries up. They call you four times in a row. You don't answer. Then they text. What you doing? And then you have the nerve to text back. Now you messed up because when you didn't answer, that was letting them know I'm not available. Stop being manipulated by people and their expectations of your time. It's your time. You're raising a family. You're trying to build your marriage. You're trying to build your business. You don't have time to be on the phone texting and talking about a bunch of silly stuff in 2020. Haven't you learned you can't waste time? And all they want to do is keep you where you are because if you grow up and if you, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, attain where you're going, it's going to make their life look like what it really is, which is a mess. But as long as you're down here with me, I feel better. Whoa. Stay away from people that are wasting your time on things that don't matter. And everybody say purpose. Why are you here? And are we fulfilling the intention of the interaction? Why are you here? I want to know proximity, parameters, and purpose. Every relationship in 2020 needs to have proximity, parameters, and purpose. Jesus understood the value of friendship, real covenant friendship. And he said, you're my friends now. How long had he been walking with them? Three years. You've given friendship, the word friendship, to somebody you met two months ago. You don't know their intent. You don't know their character. They will sell you out the first time you offend them. They were never your friend. But masquerading and Speaking to a place of deficiency, you let them too close. May the Lord strengthen you in your inner man and your inner woman so that nobody gets close because of a deficit in your life. This is good. This is, this is, this is good. Um, Jesus said, you are my friends. And here's the truth. There are things that Jesus will do for his friends that he won't do for everybody else. I'm trying to help somebody in here. I'm getting ready to preach it in a second, but I need you to get this. Jesus said, y'all are my friends. That included Peter. It included Judas. This is really deep. Jesus chose Judas. 
And even on the night he was betrayed, he said, friend, do what you do and do it quickly. Hey, friend, even as he left out, friend, knowing that he was betraying him, he still called him friend. Why? Because Judas still had a role to play. What I've learned is that I cannot, and this is another one that I got from Bishop Jakes, and I'm sharing it with y'all. You cannot respond to people solely on emotion. The Bible says you have to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Jesus knew who Judas was the whole time. He still needed him to get the job done. You have people on your job that you don't like, but you need to go ahead and speak with them because they help to get the goal accomplished. Put your pettiness aside, get the job done. It doesn't matter if you like them. God actually is sending people in your life you don't like to teach you how to build what he wants you to walk in later. Everybody's not going to be cool. We're not all going to the store afterwards. Some people you're going to have to interact with that you don't like. That's what I had to learn. And I've, I've cried to God. I said, God, I'm hurt. I feel betrayed. People that I trusted have let me down. People, there are people that take my checks but don't have my heart. He said, and now you're a pastor. Because until you don't want to show up, but you do it anyway, until you cry on the way to the church and you preach through your pain, you don't understand what it means to be a shepherd of sheep. They're sheep for a reason. They go astray. They leave when they're offended. They talk behind your back, but it doesn't change your assignment. You got to love them. I need a three-second praise break from the audience, not the band. Um, Jesus had disciples, and then he had friends. Ask somebody, are, you, are we friends? Ask them, are we friends? Last week, there was a word from God in the, in the pulpit. Pastor Todd Galbraith blessed this house. Stand up, Pastor Todd. So we stand up, sir, so we can honor you, sir. How many people were blessed by the word of God? It's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. And then had the nerve to say, Jesus can love you and still make you wait. You better preach. I'll throw this towel. I say I won't. I'll throw this wet towel at your anointed forehead. I want to show you something about Jesus. I'd like to piggyback, if I can, Pastor Todd, off of this uh, story about Lazarus because when Jesus was in Bethany, they show up and they say, uh, Jesus, uh, the one whom you love is sick. What they said is, your friend is sick. He stayed where he was two more days. Lazarus is down in the cut. Actually, Lazarus was in Bethany, right? I don't know, you, you the one preached it. Um, <laughs> but you said something very profound. You said, Lazarus died in hope. He died hoping Jesus would come. What's significant to me, and I'm getting ready to preach it, and we can go home and watch the football game, go Seahawks, but um, when, 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 when Lazarus died, that was not one of Jesus' disciples that died. It was not a favor for a centurion. It was not a woman with an issue of blood. It wasn't blind Bartimaeus. It wasn't a dead girl. It wasn't uh, the widow's son. This was his. And there are things you do for your friends that you don't do for other people. Okay, so then preach it, John. I'm trying. What we don't ever talk about is the humanity of Jesus. That he was not just grieving the loss of Lazarus as the, as the Messiah. He was not the one who walked on water. As he's heading towards Lazarus, he's grieving the loss of his friend. Because even Jesus needed a safe place to not be Jesus. Yeah. 
What do I mean by that? I'm offended. Well, here's the thing. Do you think it would be tiring for people to just keep coming up to you every single second of the day asking for a miracle, asking for a healing, asking for deliverance, casting out demons, and nobody checks on you? Nobody asks you how you doing? And you got 12 disciples, and the Bible makes it clear they didn't know who he was. They were clueless. Just, oh, man, that was crazy. I ain't never seen that like that. Oh, man. Man. Oh, man. What's your name? There were moments that the Bible records Jesus was frustrated. He was like, how long do I have to hang with these people? Do you know how hard it is to embrace the reality that you're going to have to die for people that don't even like you, actively plotting against you, and the people that the Father told you to choose as disciples don't even know who you are? But Lazarus was his friend. And when he hung out with Lazarus, he was just Jesus from Nazareth. Yo, man, it's crazy out here. Yeah, don't even worry about it. Just eat some food. Let's just talk, man. He was, a, he was fully God and fully man. It was the man that was losing his friend. But here's the point that I want you to grab, and I'm, I, I want you to get this, that Jesus didn't just declare that Lazarus was going to get up. He was believing that Lazarus was going to get up. What do I mean? He needed to operate in faith for his friend. This was probably one of the few times, if not the first time, that Lazarus said, I'm in trouble. I've never pulled on Jesus in this regard. We've been friends. I never asked him for anything, but I'm in trouble now. Somebody tell Jesus, I'm in trouble. But Jesus responded because he could have sent the word to healing. But when you're friends, you don't just send the word. You go see about it yourself. Where are the true people that have, have a real heart? for When you got somebody in your life that you love and they're in trouble, you don't just send a text. You go see about them. Where, where, your hair's not done. Your flip-flops are on. You still got your rollers in your hair. Who am I talking to? If it goes down, ain't no make, there's no makeup, there's no cosmetics. I'm coming to see you. Where are you? What's going on? I'm coming to the hospital. I'm coming to the house. I'm coming with my anointing oil. I'm coming with my prayers. Oh, oh they want to fight? I'm coming with my peace. What's, what's profound is that Jesus was believing that the father could get Lazarus up even while he was grappling with the reality that he was going to have to die and he had to believe that the father could get him up. I'm going somewhere. When he got to where Lazarus was, the Bible said he could tell the emotion and he was moved and he was stirred and he was groaning in his spirit. And he was groaning in his spirit, I believe, for two things. God, you, Father, you're saying you're going to get me up. We've never even heard of that. This man's been dead four days and you're telling me that you're going to get him up? This is my friend. Father, I need you to do me a favor for my friend. See, God does favors for his friends. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting up against something. That he does things for his friends that he doesn't do for anybody else. And we've been singing, I'm a friend of God, and what a friend we have in Jesus, and there's not a friend. But let me tell you something. When the rubber meets the road, there is no better friend than Jesus. Jesus shows up. He says, roll the stone away. This is profound. The Pharisees said, three days, the spirit hovers, then it's gone. Sadducees don't even believe in an afterlife. So all of the religious leaders are like, this is impossible. Jesus says, roll the stone away. What's funny is when Mary Magdalene ran to the tomb, the stone had been rolled away. Where are you going? God, the Father, was showing Jesus, the Son, a, a glimpse of what he was about to do in his life. Because if I can do it for your friend... You know I'm going to do it for you. I got one here, one there, one there, one there. I need you to start stirring up because the sermon is coming to a close. But God says, 
I need you to believe and celebrate what I'm going to do in your friend's life because if you can celebrate what I'm doing in their life, I'm going to do it in your life and I'm going to do it sooner. Because what I did in four days for Lazarus, I'm going to do in three for you, Jesus. I need somebody to get excited because if you have been a friend, if you have fought for other people, God's about to fight for you. I don't know why you're sitting. The sermon is almost over. I need you to stir it up back there, if y'all back there. I just need a little, a little something. Yeah, there we go. There is, in this room, you're standing. The sermon is coming to a close. Lazarus had a friend request. And Jesus, Jesus honored the request. And he said, Lazarus! Come forth. He walks out of the grave, still bound in his grave clothes. Some people were at a distance. What did his friends do? They came and took the grave clothes off. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. I need you to loose a praise in here and let it go because what God does for my friends, he will do for me. What God does for my friends, he will do for me. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees did not like Jesus. They actually hated him and they hated him even more after Lazarus got up. Because if you're a Pharisee and you've been running around talking about you have power, I'm going to ask you, how come you ain't never raised nobody from? <laughs> you got that big old robe on, but you don't have any power. And that's what God is doing now. He's exposing the difference between people who talk it and the people who actually have the anointing. Yes, he is. Across the body of Christ, that's absolutely what he's doing. It's crazy Lazarus got up and there were people who were mad. Who would be mad that a man got up who was dead? You need to identify the people that are mad that you got up. You're not happy that it didn't destroy me? Why you? You're not happy that I'm out of the grave? Oh, I got to mark you because... That means you don't have any good intended. You don't want to. They also didn't like him because of who Jesus was friends with. The Pharisees, didn't, he's a friend of tax collectors. He's a friend of sinners, wine bibbers. He has dinner with, there was a prostitute at the last dinner. She was tricking. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why he hangs with them. He doesn't hang with us. Well, they real. You're a phony with a robe on, playing church games, lying to people. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Friend request. Jesus is sending out friend requests, but it's not to the rich and the famous and the, and the cool. He's sending friend requests to the ones with a needle in their arm. He's saying, I'll be your friend. He's sending, he's sending friend requests to the ones who got a bottle at the edge of their bed. I'll be your friend. He's, he's, he's the friend to the one that just got diagnosed HIV positive. I'll be your friend. He's the friend of the one that everybody else wants to throw away. I'll be your friend. God, through the blood of Jesus, is sending friend requests for God so loved the world. Friend requests. The blood of Jesus is an extension of God's heart. I don't want to just have family. I want friends. Because I got family that's not friends. Woo! Just because we share blood don't make us friends. When you're my friend, you'll fight for me. You'll jump in front of a bullet for me, and I'll do the same for you. I lay down my life for my friend. They, they said Jesus must be guilty by association because he hangs with the unclean. 
but you treat people based on your perspective. So how come he's guilty by association as opposed to them broken people being anointed by association? See, I'm anointed by association because Jesus has called me friend. And so my imperfections have been washed over not only by the blood, but I'm anointed so I have the fragrance of my friend. And friendship is about proximity. The closer I am, the more I act like him, the more I talk like him, the more I look like him, the more I function like him. When you have friends that you've been with for a long time, y'all can finish each other's. Understand what I'm saying right now. God wants you to finish his sentence. Let there be. See, when you walk with him, you understand I'm the head and not the. See, when you've been walking with him, greater is he that's in than he that's in the. I wish I had some help in here. Oh, don't be conformed to the ways of the, but be transformed by the renewing of your. Let this be in you, which was also in. See, when you spend time with him, you talk like him. And when you talk like him, you got authority like him. And there are places that the name of Jesus can get me that my name can't get me. There are some places that, that, that I'm not allowed to get in, but if I'm with the right person. Uh, uh, who are you? I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's cool. He's with me. You missed it. I just need you to know that there's some stuff that demons have been holding on to thinking you don't have authority. I need you to walk up to the door, and when they say stop, Jesus is going to show up and move out the way, devil. He's with me. We're going to go ahead and take this territory. I need somebody to get this in your spirit. I dare you to say I'm with him. That's my friend. I'm on the list. I'm blessed. I'm prosperous. This is my year. I walk in authority. I walk in divine health. I walk in favor. I walk in power. I'm with him. That's my friend. I'm on the list. I need you to give God a shout if you know it's true. Jesus went to see about his friend. And he had friends from all walks of life. And he's still looking for friends today. Today, there's a friend request at the altar. I don't care who you are, what you've done, who you've done it with. I don't care how, how much weed you've smoked, how much you've drank, how many needles you I don't care how many people you slept with, who you slept with, and how. I need you to know that Jesus wants to change your heart. And there is a friend request right here. I need you to get to the altar, and I need you to move. I need you to move quickly, quickly, quickly. If you want to get saved or if you want to be a member of Relentless Church, come down here and get your friend request. Come to 